Everybody, welcome to the UX and data meetup. This is Sabrina CU, and um, just a little bit of background on Sabrina. She's a product designer based in New York City. Um, she currently works for Augury, a machine learning startup where she focuses on combining principles of design and user behavior to create a compelling predictive platform. Wow, that's a mouthful. Everyone, give a warm welcome to Sabrina CU. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the very warm welcome. All right, so once again, I'm a product designer at Augury, and from my point of view, I work on designing a platform that will help predict when manufacturing machines fail before they actually fail. And so the outline of my talk today will be about data labeling, how to design for data labeling, but I've structured it this way. So uh, let me take a gauge of my audience here. Uh, who of you work in tech? Okay, actually, who doesn't work in tech? Anyone? Cool. Um, who works with the product team in any way, shape, or form? Awesome. And then who works with machine learning tools, techniques, data? Awesome. Cool. All right, pretty technical crowd. So for those who don't work with machine learning, I've started by including an example of machine learning through sorting tomatoes. And this is going to illustrate a very specific set um, of machine learning models. And so why don't we get started here? Let's frame our question as, is this an image of a tomato? So, you know, we know what's a tomato is not a tomato, but, you know, let's say our model doesn't. Until we start training our model with images of potatoes and tomatoes. And the reason there is potatoes and tomatoes here is because we want to train it with, you know, what we know are tomatoes and what we know are not tomatoes. So once we fed it enough images of potatoes and tomatoes, let's see if it has learned what a tomato is. And yes, all right, it knows what a cherry tomato is. Congratulations. All right, so let's feed it a potato image. Does it know, is this image a, potato, a tomato or not? And correct, it knows a potato is not a tomato. So congratulations again. But let's feed it something it hasn't seen, an apple. You know, does our model train on potatoes and tomatoes think that this is a tomato? Quite possibly, it's red and round, but We'll have you know, our hand of God come in and say, actually, no, apples are not tomatoes. And so that's incorrect. So we'll retrain. Toma potatoes and apples are not tomatoes. And so after training, feed the apple once in again, and correct, an apple is not a tomato. And so what is this example illustrating? Let's break it down here. So every time I came in and told the model either incorrect or correct, these are updated labels. So now the model knows like, what is a tomato and what is probably not a tomato. And then more specifically, this is called supervised learning with concept drift. And like to put it in terms other than potatoes, tomatoes, and apples, you know, we have weather models, but if weather models don't take into account seasonal, you know, the summer season or the winter season, then it may get more inaccurate once the seasons change. Or consumer, consumer spending models um, are modeled using like normal cash spending data at retail stores, but don't take into account the economy is doing better or worse, then you know, it may drift over time. So why is this important from the user experience point of view? For me, in my point of view, I see machine learning products as taking two forms. One form is the user, me, I purely consume the outputs of machine learning models. For example, if I Google images of cats and I find cats, cool. I don't do anything with that, but I found my cats. On the other side, we have platforms that are specifically dedicated to label images, but my only task in those platforms are to label those images. So you hear like Mechanical Turk or people hired specifically to you know, find images of cars and traffic photos, that is this other uh, set of machine learning products that I'm talking about. So the intersection of these two areas what I work in and I find the most interesting and a pretty challenging problem to solve. It's when the user has to consume and interpret machine model outputs and I want to do my job with whatever I get outputted, but I also need to give the model feedback in a way so that it learns over time. So there's this concept of designing with just enough uncertainty that I can still do my job but know that the confidence is not 100%. 
So cool, we've covered the machine learning part of this intro. The next is we'll go over some user experience principles that I like and I think about every day. And so we'll start with the concept that user experience is not just user interface design. And I find this important to emphasize, and we all know that conceptually, but at work, when we see images of screens, we think that's user experience design. That's a very easy trap to fall into. But so this is an example of a honeycomb designed by Peter Morville. He's the quote unquote founding father of information architecture. And this is presented in such a modular way to help us think about these seven facets and seven questions that we should ask ourselves when designing products. So to go through them, one, usefulness. Like, does this proposed prop solution address the needs? Like, does it actually answer a real problem that people have? It's a, always a good thing to challenge the problem statement. For desirable, it's more emotional. Like, does this product that I make appeal to emotion? Does it make people happy to use it? And then is it usable? Like, is everything laid out in such a way that I can find it? And then is it made in such a way that it helps me do my job or do whatever it is that I'm trying to do when I'm using the product? And then this leads into findable. Again, is everything laid out in such a way that I can use it? Is it intuitive? And this is actually a pretty hard question to answer because if it's intuitive, it's like obviously it should be that way. But once it's not intuitive, it's like, what is the way it's supposed to be? Accessible. Um, we shall never forget to design for the people who are not like us, like people who are colorblind, if you're not colorblind, people that use different operating systems, different devices, um, maybe people who navigate the web using voice. Um, for machine learning products, credibility is a huge thing. You know, if people don't understand technology that's driving the product, how can we get them to trust what the product is outputting? Um, and then finally, companies and stakeholders care about this part. Is, is the final output of all these questions going to advance the company's mission statement? Are we doing the job that we're paid to do? So designers think about all those questions when they're making products, but ultimately the end user really just evaluates products using these three questions. Does it give me value? Is it easy to use? And is it pleasant to use? And then this, the answer to these three questions dictate the uh, returnability. Like, are they gonna use this product over and over again? And the way that I think about designing with those seven questions in mind and then to answer these three questions is to use uh, heuristics. So some heuristics that I follow, so visibility of system status, and what this means is that whatever the system doing should be really obvious. So in this example, I'm installing El Capitan on my Mac. I know there's about 25 seconds remaining, which is actually less than half the time it's supposed to take, so it's a pretty short process. And then right after this installs, the computer's gonna restart. So when it blacks out, I'm not surprised. So this has set my expectations up for success. Um, match between system and the real world. So, you know, it can be using language, like call potatoes taters, for example, if you're designing a product for people that call potato taters. Or, you know, use real names, like cherry tomatoes, instead of objects or instances. And then doing that will help people feel friendlier and feel like your product is catered directly towards them. And this is a challenge that I find a lot when designing technical products is like, I want to refer things like assets and nodes and asset graph, but like, what does that mean to people? Like, you know, they don't know. And so always be cognizant of using common terms. Using control and freedom is important because, you know, we click around all the time, stumble into places and, you know, actions that we want to get out of. Um, or like we leave a comment that we want to delete or edit. So having this ability in products helps us feel it in control. It's not the product is using us, we're using the product. Error recovery, in that same vein, we accidentally click into things, um, we want to cancel out. And so a good error recovery module tells you exactly what's going to happen, what the downsides of what's going to happen is. Like if you delete something, you know, you better know that it's going to be deleted forever. If you didn't know, it's really bad. Um, and if you want to cancel out, it's easy to very easily cancel out of there. Um, for recognition rather than recall, it's a, a pretty lofty term, but what this really means is that we can only remember about five things at a time. And so if we want them to remember more things like, you know, whatever I typed in before, previously when I typed in A, Google will tell me. Um, an offline example of this concept is learning languages. For example, like when I see a Chinese character, it's much easier for me to recognize it than to write it from scratch. So that's an example of recognition rather than the recall. 
All right, so we've covered some heuristics. And finally, um, the outputs of machine learning models often can be visualized. So for some visualization techniques, um, the concept of position, length, area, size, or slope, brightness, hue, and text, these are all good for different things. So for example, position and length, and obviously text, are good for exact values. Um, Length is really good for visually communicating ratios. Obviously, the longer one is you know, more important or longer. Area and hue is really good for drawing attention. The bigger areas are more important. The brighter colors are more important. And then put into example here, it's a really, really complex diagram. But if you use contrast and hue, and maybe a projector that has a little more contrast, you can see that the numbers are different than the object that they're pointing to. And so you can use this to separate and the different layers on the screen. Cool. All right, so we went over a machine learning example. We all got on the same page for that. And then we never went over some user experience design principles. So how do we combine those two to design the actually labeling experience? This is the fun part. Let's go back to our tomato example. Let's assume that my product is I want to automate tomato picking out of a bunch of vegetables. And you know, let's pretend I had some background in tomatoes, and I think that this is going to be a very valuable product. So as a user experience designer, I want to first go out and see like, who am I designing this product for? Do they actually need this product? So I go do an in-person visit, and I see, oh, cool. Tomatoes are actually sorted in a conveyor belt and there are people in the middle that are picking out tomatoes as they go from one end to the other. You know, possibly there's a lot of things going on here. It's very loud and noisy, and maybe there's somebody in charge, somebody, like most of these people don't have computer screens, but maybe there's one person that has a computer screen. These are all things we can find out through in-person visits. But also, after in-person visits, we can do user interviews with the tomato farmers themselves. And, Okay, so like here's a summary of a tomato farm, but let me let me explain like what this is. So as a user interviewer, you go out and you want to talk to more than one, like preferably three or more tomato farmers, so you can get like a, a summary of their, all their experiences and see and make a composite person. And this fake person and their fake needs and wants create a persona. And then we can design towards this person and think about this person as we're designing our product. So in our fake user interviews, these are the seven questions that we've uncovered. One, she is not very familiar with machine learning models, but knows a lot about tomatoes. Cool. Uh, she wants to know where she needs to interact with the platform. She wants confirmation that her inputs mean something. She does not have a lot of time to spend on the platform. She is already working dawn to dusk, is really busy, and needs this to ultimately save her time and not take up more of her time. And then, the last two, she is accustomed to using desktop on mobile apps and she has a Mac and an iPhone. So these summary is grand and all, but like, what does this actually mean for our product development? And so the way I usually break it down is, okay, this first statement, she is not very familiar with machine learning models but knows a lot about tomatoes. So what this means to me is nothing should be too complex. It should be action oriented to be sure what she should do. Um, and then the context should provide what she knows in the real world. So it's very familiar and she knows exactly what to do. Um, the next one, she wants to know where she needs to interact with the platform, so obvious cues. Again, action-oriented, really obvious what she should do. She wants confirmation that her inputs mean something. So again, confirmation received of feedback, could show updates, predictions. She wants incentive so that she will keep on interacting with the platform. Um, she does not have a lot of time to spend on platform, so everything should be very obvious to the point. So we see a trend um, in these four questions. We action-oriented, very simple, um, to the point. And then she's already so busy, so this needs to fit into our workflow and echo the real world environment that she's in. And then these last two points, she's accustomed to using modern desktop and mobile apps, and then she already has a phone, so we can follow modern design conventions, don't need to design for the old age or you know, some future, future society. So we have some starting points from here. And so the way we can start is to look at what annotation platforms are already out there. Um, so here are four actual annotation platforms. And a cool side note is that this one right here, Labelbox, just raised their Series A. So hey, like, cool, we know these things are doing good things. 
Um, and so we can see that there are very large areas. So right here, I've broken down the areas of the screen. There's a very large area for data, and then there's a very large area for feedback. And the reason this is important is that we can see that the annotation platforms that people are using to really, really quickly annotate are composed of two parts. So we can keep this in the back of our mind and remember this as we're designing. But we need to go back and design for our tomato farmer persona. So what is she seeing and what is she doing when she wants to find this tomato picker automator? Here's a possible flow of how this could fit into her lifestyle. She's on a tomato floor, she's walking around, steel toed boots, hard hat glasses, gets a ping. Oh, she needs to do something. And so she probably will do one of three actions. She'll ignore the notification, which is the model's worst case scenario. We need feedback from her to know whether or not our automator is right. She can either blindly accept, which is also not great because you know, we're probably gonna be wrong if she just accepts it, our model will be trained using the wrong labels. And then so the most likely one is she'll probably verify herself whether or not the image that we've told her is or is not a tomato, is or is not a tomato, and then accept or reject it. And we want that to happen because then we can take her subject matter expertise, her tomato farmer expertise, and apply it and make our model the new tomato farmer. And then, it's okay, so after this workflow, in you know, our minds, it could translate into a two-page platform. Very simple, remember, she does not have a lot of time and she's action-oriented. So it'd be somewhere to get notified and get alerts, and you know, expect updated results, give her incentive to keep on updating, and then a main work area where she can consume and interpret the model insights and then give the model feedback. So alerts, work area. So this flow is personally one of my favorites, like to do all these flows, but everyone always expects um, low fidelity, high fidelity mockups. So let's go into that. So here's an example of what a notification center could look like. Remember, she's on the factory floor, there's a conveyor belt full of tomatoes, things go by one by one. So you can see you know, maybe an image of a tomato, things are in lines, things are you know, calculated by a, model, by a model, and she can really quickly say tomato or not a tomato. And then the main work area could possibly be largely an image classification area um, with some metadata that's gonna help her classify the image and then possibly a feedback area. So when she has put her subject better expertise on whether or not it's a tomato, the model wants to know. It could be very simple. So let's bring it up to medium fidelity. So the notification center could have the images on the left and obviously we know what's a tomato and not a tomato and so like we can classify these very easily. But like if it's more complicated, then you need more information. That's a caveat here. But we also see the conveyor line, so to help her contextualize where this vegetable is located. You know, possibly we have different models running, we can specify which model has labeled which image as such, um, a date on when this has entered the inbox, and then a quick label section, like is this a tomato? And then possibly some interactions. She can use her mouse hover, you know, see um, interactions on the platform. And then for the main work area here, Remember, she's really quickly thinking about what this image could be. We show her the image. In this case, you know, is this a tomato? Probably not. Um, and then, so she has her labels on the top right, tomato, not a tomato, some metadata there, what date it is, you know, which line it was, which production line it was, maybe that's important. And then the left to right, she gets one image at a time, really quickly. And then remember in our user design principles, we thought about accessibility and shortcuts. Here, you know, if she doesn't want to use her mouse and navigate everywhere on the page, click tomato, click not a tomato, click left and right, she has not a lot of time. We'll map keys and shortcuts to this image. So left and right could be just, you know, scrolling left from the image, up and down could map to label things tomato, not a tomato. So these are a way and a product can be fit to fit the tomato farmer. And then finally, put in the context of our model training, expected results, you know, middle of the Venn diagram, we can see that she can consume and interpret the model insights in such a way that she could do her job. You know, she knows that things that are not being shown on this uh, screen are classified as tomatoes. Um, and then we get feedback, tomato or not a tomato, from her. And then you know, this feedback loop can very easily be done. 
So obviously, we can never forget to iterate and test. We've done our user interviews, but you know, what if the initial questions we asked were not the right questions? What if we design a product that is for a very specific use case? So we should always iterate and test our product. And you know, as an example, here's some real feedback that I've gotten before designing products that are very similar to this tomato one. So for example, I once did a trend graph, and drew a line in the middle, and like had things in the background. I thought it was very obvious, but the first question people ask is, what is good or bad? Is above the line good? Is below the line good? So it was really good that I asked for feedback on that. No incentive to check the box, you know? They give up after a while. If the model is an update, why do I care about giving you feedback? It's extra time on my hands. Um, they don't know what's supposed to happen. They think it's supposed to be, I don't know. Um, or the model just keeps on giving them alerts and does not update with their feedback, so then, again, they feel like it's useless. Like, why do I care? Why do I want to, why do I want to help this model get smarter? Um, this one, they don't trust it. I just ignore everything it says and do it myself. We don't like that. Um, and then this one is, I want to go back in time to see why I accepted it, but I can't. So historical behavior is really important to capture. So like, if this model is now overfit, like, let's go back and see like, you know, what exactly happened. And you can see like, did I mislabel in the past or like, is it, were the data points you know, of a certain category in the past? Um, and then finally, it's like, you know, I thought I didn't have to interact with the platform once it's data science and all. This is also not good. We want to make sure and you know, empower the user to give us feedback. And so these are all instances where I took some learnings and so hopefully you can also learn from this. So finally, we have a unique product problem is the user needs to be able to do their job with our model outputs, but also we need to take in inputs from them. So that's like designing with just the right amount of uncertainty while empowering them, while having the platform be simplistic enough that they know what they're supposed to do and give us insights. And so how we, do we tackle that? Through UX principles, through understanding technology, through some data visualization principles, knowing users and iterating. Um, so that's the end of this talk. Thank you very much. Um, this is our Q&A section. So if anyone has questions, please raise your hand. I'll come right to you. Um, so first of all, thank you. I work with a lot of machine learning companies, but with training models, I usually think of them as B2B, and UX isn't that important, but truly it is, because you need that engagement. Um, I imagine the people who train the models, there's a wide variety of stakeholders who are qualified to give input, but they vary on their level of subject matter expertise. So do you alter the UX based on like who the user is that's training the model? And if so, like in what ways? Well, I would say it depends on who your target persona is and how many different levels of users your company wants to design for. Um, so, you know, based on that, maybe yes, maybe no, it kind of depends. Um, and then obviously you should design for the user that will give your, well, from the data science perspective, I think you can design for the user that will give your model the most input, so maybe the most valuable subject matter expert, but it may, maybe not. It depends on the company mission. Thank you for your question. Anyone else? She's coming right now with the mic. Um, thank you for the awesome talk. Um, so I'm a data scientist and I actually work a lot with, uh, with a team that is dedicated to labeling work. So one thing that we um, put a lot of thought into is that how do we send the, like the examples and or in this context alerts to the users, and I'm curious hearing your thoughts on, like, is it based on the model's confidence? Do we only send them the low confidence ones, or is it based on, I don't know, the maybe the maximum capacity, um, et cetera? That's a great question, and I hate to say it depends, but it kind of <laughs> depends on what you want to happen once your model is trained. So to give a live example at work today, actually, I was talking with like the VP of strategy on whether or not we want to display the confidence of our predictions on failure. Um, 
And you know, if we do, what kind of input can we get? And so what we decided is, like, we need to understand, right now we have no data in this aspect, but our model maybe knows like, when it's gonna predict failure. Um, so like, we need to collect all the information we can, so we're gonna show them all the confidence levels, and then have our subject matter experts give us confidence levels in response. Actually, let me go back a little bit. So here, my first iteration of the slide, before I talked to one of my coworkers who's a data scientist, had the confidence level on it, and I was like, the model, we are 85% confidence this is a tomato. But his feedback to me was, showing the confidence level biases the results, which is really good feedback. So, oh yeah, now they say that, obviously. And so like, we, on the back end, we know how confident this model is, but as the user, like, you know, I don't want to be biased, so I will give my own input, and then we can just extract them both on the back end and then match them and do whatever we want with those pieces of information. Does that answer your question? Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, my question is about more complex labeling tasks where the label might be about a piece of text and whether you have any thoughts on model explanations, um, like highlighting a piece of text that says, oh, this is why we labeled it you know, X versus Y. Yeah, so my answer will be about designing in explanations around what happens. I think best practices for that, well, like you always want to help them do the job that you want them to do. So if it's that you want them to highlight certain words, like everything in your help box or you know help overlay would be centered around that. Like you need to do X because of Y. Um, and some best practices for designing that is, you know, pop-ups. Um, just everything displayed at one glance, um, like no drop downs, you just want everything visible. Hopefully that helps. Sort of a follow on to that last question, for those more complex labeling tasks, uh, when is the decision point to have verification and multiple people lab labeling or have you put any thought into that question? Yes. So. I think with people, there's always many biases. Um, so probably a good thing to do first is you know what labels you want to extract and probably give them a test. And so you can see like who's the more conservative one, who's more risky, um, and then you know maybe choose between those. Um, and then once that has happened, what I would do is, you know, I would give them all their own individual things to label, but every once in a while, I'd give two or more people the same thing so you can make sure that there isn't one person that is always labeling something differently. And just to follow up on that, would you design that into your tool? Yeah, so it's also something I think about at work. There's the consumer side, who's people who need the model office to do their job, obviously. And then that's more of the labeling side. And so if you, for us, like, you know, maybe it's easier to use the same product to tackle both of them. There's, we think of alternate views because we're diverging. Like our subject matter experts are so expert, like they don't need the model apples to do their job. Um, and then so we're gonna have too many options um, or you know, offer them too many label choices and cloud the interface. And so we're probably gonna you know, do two products. Um, but I think that is a little bit up to you to decide when to draw that line. Thank you so much. That was a really good talk. Um, when the labels are not as binary, uh, you know, as in this case, it is either a tomato or not a tomato, but uh, when you look at things like uh, facial recognition and look at services like Amazon recognition that even gives you a percentage of your gender, ethnicity, age, are there some practices or examples based on your uh, previous work on how designers can, you know, we can help design the labels better to avoid those outliers? So avoiding giving people the wrong gender, or? Yeah, so if, if you look at most of these data sets, they're like massive amount of data sets. Most of them are, these AI startups are getting them trained via Amazon Turks or, you know, people setting offshore or just labeling, you know, people like us based on what they assume our gender is or our ethnicity is or our age is. Right? Um, how, how do you think uh, better labels 
uh, or even design the whole interface, how can we as designers design it better to avoid mislabeling someone? That's a very complicated question because there's a lot of implicit biases. Because um, us as people, like we learn how to identify people through people in our surroundings or growing up. Um, and so I think, like I actually don't have any answers for that. I would just say try to account for as many biases as you can think of and always allow for you know, different types of labels. Sorry, it wasn't a better answer. Uh, hi, my name is Chao. Um, I'm uh, currently working on a product team for uh, artificial intelligence prediction company. Um, I just uh, have a question, very practical question about like uh, when you are doing prototyping. You know, as an experienced designer, we're required to do prototyping for the product before the development process. But since it's a machine learning uh, product. Uh, some of the data visualization is um, generated by the algorithm. So, how could we do a mocap without knowing the like results? That's my question. Yeah, um, I would. So the way I do that is I try to integrate myself with the data science team when they're doing the actual calculations or trying to figure out what questions they're answering, um, because. There's often many different ways to visualize the same thing, and if there's ways that are going to help you prototype better than others, I think it's important to get your voice heard. And like, ultimately, if we understand the technology and they understand the design constraints, I think the product will be better. Um, and then you know, sometimes it's just looking at what data visualizations they have used in the past, just putting those in your mocks, and just doing the best you can. Okay, thank you. Hi, when you work with a deep learning, a very complex multi-layer deep learning, how do you suggest to uh, report results of self-correcting of machine learning? Is it the dashboard? Is it like how? Did you have any experience with that? Um, I will say the UX principle, the visibility of system status, is very important to that problem. Um, it may be showing that it's refreshing, showing historically what it was. Um, because let's say like if I was on a page and it refreshed under me and it, I didn't see what it used to be, but I see now it's somewhat different, that reduces my confidence in the page. Um, and so just showing histor historically what it used to be is important for context. As to where that should be shown, I think it again depends on the product, but often if there's like a summary page that shows a list of all the results, that there is a good page to do it. Um, typically products have like a history section. Um, so I think that is good to show like what has influenced the current model to become the way it is, and then if it's auto-correcting for the future or like currently right now, just like on the main display page, could be interesting. Hi, um, I have a question that's not easy to answer, um, and also many of you may be thinking about this. So if anyone else has thoughts on this, I'd like to hear it. Um, but uh, I'm working on researching a an kind of early stage project where the subject matter experts are kind of very senior people that don't necessarily want, want to invest a bunch of time into labeling. So I guess I'm very curious about your thoughts on, especially for that kind of subject matter expert, how you can demonstrate value and like ROI and to really incentivize them to continue to interact with the platform. And this is the thing you pointed out about um, something needing to fit into their workflow, um, not just, I mean, in this model, I think you're just trying to minimize disruption um, but how do you make it kind of a seamless part of what people are doing every day so it doesn't feel like this separate task that I have to be doing? Um, I think there are two parts to my answer. I would say for both of the questions that you asked, incentivizing is really important, but not even like only incentivizing to the platform, maybe like educational programs or like going there and showing them that you're a person and you need their input to do a job. That goes a long way. Like for me, I work with subject matter experts that are remote, and so I can Slack them all I want, but video conferences, or like visiting them, actually gives me great results. It's funny how that happens. Um, and then fitting into their workflow, I think it d takes really understanding of what their workflow is, but also understanding what you need from them. Because often what I found I do, if I don't understand the problem, is just kind of get as much 
labeling as possible from them, but often a lot of that is discarded and I don't need it. So just being smart about my time and their time. Thank you. Any more questions? Anyone? If you're using an annotation tool to check how accurate a model that's already been trained is, it might present you with many of the correct instances of something. So for example, over here, you might see tomato, 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 and then a pumpkin. Somebody might start to get in the groove of just hitting tomato, 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 tomato. Is there anything you can do to kind of slow that down or ensure that they actually have to critically think about what they're seeing? And I think that this becomes especially important when you're dealing with like somebody else mentioned text, so they actually have to read it, and especially when they're dealing with a lot of text, like in a complex agreement or something like that. Yeah. I think, so like, you know chatbots, they can read your message and technically they can write, reply instantaneously, but a lot of times they have like the dot, 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 and then typing, and that's an artificial insertion of time. And you could do the same thing, like, I know it slows down their work process, but it could make them think. Um, alternatively, you possibly could insert something that you know is a certain thing, and if they label it the wrong way, just tell them they're wrong, and that will interrupt their workflow. So I think the question that you're really asking is, how do you get them to like, not get into a groove, and it's maybe constantly interrupting them, or providing them other like, incentives, um, something along those lines. Any, anyone else has a question? Oh. Hi. Oh. Sorry. Um, quick question. When you have a lot of data to work with and a lot of outputs, how do you communicate? And then, you're, and then you have different opinions, right? Different people you're designing for. How do you communicate um, which, which data or which information to show on the UI? when you have different opinions? Different opinions on what I should show? Yeah. Find the one that's most right? No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, I am currently also struggling with that at work, is how do I take into account, just like even like feedback in general, like how do you know what the right direction to go with your product is? Um, a little bit of the thing is product intuition, but I think ultimately, like everything you present to the user should have some sort of meaning. So if you prioritize exactly what kind of feedback you're getting from the labels, then you know you can maybe cut it off after priority five, for example, and then only the top five will be on the page. Um, so I think priority, since it's an ordered list, can be hammered out with your stakeholders, and then once you know priority, then it's easier to design. Uh, two related questions. You talked about incentivizing, and two thoughts come to mind. One is, disincentivizing people, you know, not a mild electric shock necessarily, but penalizing them if they get it wrong and rewarding them if they do something right. Employing some, employing some game theory that, you know, you identified 85% of these correctly, you guys sitting next to you got 95% of them correct. So sort of have them focus a little bit more. Do you employ any of those sorts of methods? Currently, the number of subject matter experts I work with that label the data is so few, they know who is more right and who is more valuable. I think, if you think about like flywheel or spin class, they show the, who is like the fastest, I think it's like the one who has spun the fastest, I don't know. But there's like an order and that is the incentive. So obviously you, the, the same principles can be applied in you know, every leaderboard like, or like um, whoever has labeled the most gets something. Um, so you can use that sort of incentive. Uh, hey, thanks for the talk. But really good. Um, do you ever get requests from the, uh, you know, people constructing the model to capture more information about the labeling process itself, like how long it takes to classify a specific label, or like the rate of disagreement between labelers, which I guess might be useful features for the model itself? The answer to that question is definitely a yes. Um, like often the success 
of an initiative for labeling can be reducing the time spent on something from X number to X number. Um, and that's like a great incentive to have and something that my team is measured against. But establishing baseline is really hard. And I think so, like one, is there baseline? And two, like is the new expectation realistic? And then, I'm sorry, I forgot the second part to your question. Metadata for how long it took each person to do the job, yes. Um, I always get requests to capture as much information as possible, and I think it's my responsibility as a user experience designer to make sure that they're not overcrowded with how much information they're supposed to give back to us. Um, and so it's a balance between, like, there was only maybe like 10 hours in a work day, or maybe 12 hours in a work day. Um, and like, how much like, in work are they supposed to get done? Like, how much time can they spend labeling for, you know, us? So I think it's a balance you have to strike. Um, in your experience, do your subject matter experts, uh, like, talk to each other? Do you have a, like, formalized process for them to go over, like, disagreements and kind of come to consensus on how they want to be labeling things? Or, like, does that change over time? And Yes, um, for us, Actually, all of them are based in different areas in the U.S., but they have their own Slack channel, um, and then they have reliable—they have—they're well, all reliability engineers. So they have reliability summits once a quarter. So they come in and they all express what like frustrations they have with the platform. What do they like the most? Um, and they go through a retro on a like a machine that has failed that they did not catch, and then. It's really interesting to see, they all look at different features, so use that to diagnose failure. Um, and then so, for us, seeing those retros is really important to know what features to you know, possibly include or emphasize in future iterations. Chris, how do you handle the like, evolution of the labels underneath it? Like, I know like, tomato and other tomato is like, a good starting point, but like, at some point, you might want to know, like, is it a rotten tomato or like, a yeah, um, so we always want to anticipate labels or like, you know, in this case it was like a one label situation, but for the way we handle it right now is have the possibility for free text, um, or actually even right now it's all free text and so I'm trying to go through and making sure to like categorize it so it's much easier for people to, you know, categorize the labels, um, but having that option to make new labels and then for other people to instantaneously like, see that new label and apply it if it matters um, and then just regularly checking in to see like what has been created over time that will account for that edge case we have time for one more question all righty give another round of applause for sabrina thank you so much thank you sabrina um for our volunteers, give a round of applause. Lisa, Gloria, the mic on, Rowan, Bill, give it up for Bill. Bill, oh, you have an announcement? Okay. Would you? Yeah. Yeah. You want to take the mic now, Elaine? Sure. Yeah. Elaine, everybody. Hi, everyone. I'm Elaine, and I'm one of the co-organizers of our sister meetup, Data in the Greater Good. And our next meetup is next Thursday, May 16th, at Nomad Works, 6.45 p.m. And we hope that all of you will join us at that meetup. For those of you that aren't familiar with Data in the Greater Good, our focus is the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the beauty of data for social justice, humanities, arts, um, and other mission-driven organizations. So we've had speakers from the Met, Lincoln Center, we recently had the 92nd Street Y, and next week's meetup will be with Donors Choose. It is an online platform uh, where donors can give to public schools and often in underserved communities. So we hope that all of you will join us as we will hear from uh, digital marketing at that meetup on how they are using machine learning for donors choose. So please sign up for that online. 
Round of applause, Elaine. Thank you. Um, so, we're going to do this again and again and again. So next month, June 12th, we have another event, Data That Works, How to Build an Analytics Practice. Our speaker for that night is going to be Michelle Glasser, who has built the analytics team at WW, uh, formerly known as Weight Watchers. She will share what's worked with product desi and design to make data-driven decisions and help to, and help to transform a 55-year-old company into a tech-enabled, data-rich powerhouse. That's pretty interesting because Weight Watchers is like a pretty, pretty much like they have good tenure as far as like a company. And to come in the tech world now is very interesting how they made that transition. Um, so I hope to see everyone there. Um, last thing, everyone, uh, it's great to see you guys all together. We are a very small community. Um, so I know how awkward it could be meeting someone new. All right, but just say what's up to everybody. Like, just say what's up to the person next to you. You guys know each other, right? So it doesn't count. No, you gotta, you gotta say somebody. You gotta say what's up to somebody else. All right. Um, so everybody, have a good night. Get home safe. Thank you for coming again. Give yourself a round of applause, and me, because I have low self-esteem. No, I'm joking. I need, I need some validation sometimes. Um, so everybody, have a good night. Eat the rest of the pizza, soda. Say what's up to everyone. Take care.